good to you, everyone. Good to you, and good to you. A good bench to Chodesh, and a good bench to Vach, and only good, 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 good news and happiness and joy Amen. and simchas for everyone. All the blessings should come down over here. Take it for Miyad immediately. So this week we have this chust coming up this week. Chafhei Adar, the twenty-fifth day of Adar. Today was the twenty-second. Tonight is already the twenty-third. So Monday night, Monday night is going to be the 25th day of Adar, of Adar Aleph, and it's the Yorzai Tilula of Reb Avram Gershon of Kitov, the, brother, the brother-in-law of the Holy Baal Shem Tov, who is a major, major, who is a major um, figure in the story of Hasidus and the Baal Shem Tov. He passed away actually in an Adar Aleph. So his yard site is Adar Aleph, particularly. He passed away actually the same year the Baal Shem Tov passed. The next year, the Baal Shem Tov passed away in the year Tov Kuf Chof. He passed away in the year Tov Kuf Chof Aleph. That means he never, he wasn't alive by the first, Baal, the first yard site of his brother-in-law, the Baal Shem Tov. When you read the letters and the correspondence between Reb Gershon and the Holy Baal Shem Tov, you see that they had a love that is indescribable. They loved each other with an incredible, this incredible bond. So it could be, you know, when the Baal Shem Tov passed away, he didn't really find that much more to be, be here anymore. He was so connected. You know what's really exciting? What's really exciting is we are all sitting over here. We're here today because we're Hasidim. A Hasidim like stories. It's probably pretty likely to say that the first Hasid was Reb Gershon of Kitov. The first being who was a Hasid. Reb Gershon was never a Rebbe. We usually we do this on, we usually do this about Rabbeim. Reb, Reb Gershon was never a Rebbe, but he was a Hasid. If he wasn't the first, he was from the first three Hasidim. Because he was from the first who got who the Baal Shem Tov revealed himself to him. And when you say in the beginning he was a misnagat to the Baal Shem Tov, it doesn't mean once the Baal Shem Tov was revealed. He gave the Baal Shem Tov a very hard time, but that was when the Baal Shem Tov was playing games. You know, this week in the parsha you read how Moshe Rabbeinu had a mask on his face. And the, and the, and the, and the, and the, the, the Pasuk says that Moshe wore the mask to cover up his radiant face. But the, the Pasuk says that Moshe would remove the mask when he would speak to the Jewish people. And he would speak to Hashem, he would remove the mask. Now when Moshe was spatzering, when Moshe was doing anything that's not speaking to Yidin or speaking to the Yebishter, Moshe always had a mask on his face. But when he spoke to the Yidin, he, he took off his mask. The Baal Shem Tov had a mask on his face. Literally. When I say literally, it, in the stories it says about the Baal Shem Tov, the Baal Shem Tov was able to change his face from looking like an angel, like a malach elikim, with a blinding light, that you looked at his face and you saw that you're dealing with an ishalikim, kaddish v'neira, and, 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 and even regular people, when you looked at the Baal Shem Tov, you started trembling. You saw a face like, like it says about the Baal Shem Tov, that the roimimus melech adir, this is the Lushen, it says, the Alter Rebbe says about the Baal Shem Tov, that the roimimus melech adir, the exaltedness of an incredible great king, of an of a, of a emperor, with all of his glory, is ayin, is nothing in comparison to the awesomeness of the Baal Shem Tov. And yet the Baal Shem Tov was able to hide himself. And when he would hide himself, he would appear like a very simple peasanty person, like a very simple villager that has nothing, that is, that is ignorant. And there were stories, and we're going to relate one of those stories, that the Baal Shem Tov was able to like play games with people. He would... When the Baal Shem Tov was in the beginning of his revelation, he was able to remove his mask and kind of flash the person and then hide himself again and, the, and create a tumbling in the person's mind, not knowing who he's looking at. But he literally had a mask. And the Baal Shem Tov had that mask on with Reb Gershon of Kitov for quite a bit in the beginning. And Reb Gershon gave the Baal Shem Tov a very hard time. 
So let's tell the story first that brings Reb Gershon of Kittav, the first, probably the first chassid, the one of the first chassidim, into play. Um, like how does, he, how, do, how does he enter the Baal Tov's life? He enters the Baal Tov's life because the Baal Tov is trying to enter into his life. The Baal Tov was seeking to enter into Reb Gershon of Kittav's family. This was when the Baal Tov was about 18, 19 years old. And he was of course a hidden tzaddik. He hung out with the hidden tzaddikim. There was a whole hidden club. It was a tzaddikim club. And not everybody got membership in that club. These were incredible tzaddikim. And they were led, they, they were led by various different mystics who would lead these tzaddikim. And the leadership went over from various different, uh, there's a whole story about them. There were different balshems, Rabbi Adam Balshem, and uh, who were the other, Rabbi Yerl Balshem, a few, a few balshems. And then, of course, was Rabbi Yisrael Balshem. But um, the Balshem was part of this kvutz of hidden tzaddikim. When he was a little boy, he already met up with them. They took him under his wing, because the Baal Shem Tov was an orphan, as we know. And uh, he, the tzaddikim had this minute that they would go around the villages, and they would be mechazik the yidden. They were, high, they were strengthening the yidden. They would tell them stories. And the Baal Shem Tov was also Isaac in it. But he was dressed like a very, like, not like a, not, not in rabbinic garb. You know, there's rabbinic garb, and there was the simple garb. The Baal Shem Tov dressed like a simple, like a simple working man a villager, and so he would move around from place to place. At a certain time, he came to a town not far from, Bo- from Brod, and I guess he knew that the time has come to just, re- me, like you say, in, 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 there's a, a, a vart in, there's a, in Gemara, it's called Megala Tefach, to reveal a little bit of who he is. So the Baal Shem Tev in that place stopped playing ignorant. He was a Malamid. He was hired to be a Malamid in the town. It was a town not far from Brod, Reb Gershon of Kitov lived at that time in Brod. Brod was a very important city in the uh, Galiziana neighborhoods, in Galicia. Ukraine, next to Ukraine, that's where Brod was. And, and it was known to be the Chachme Brod, Goinim, real, real geniuses, very big London, very big Talmud Chachamim lived there. Goinim, Bali Ruach HaKodesh, incredible. Uh, 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 scholars, incredible scholars. They lived in the city of Brod. The Baal Shem Tev became a Malamid in a city, in a town, probably a small town, not far from Brod. And he mingled a little bit with the people and he started to show himself a little bit. He revealed a little bit of his spiritual charisma. And the people started, were getting drawn to him. And they turned to him for advice. And then they saw that he knows a little bit how to learn. So they started asking him some questions, halacha, this, that, and he would... And then what happened was when people started having arguments or, 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 or people had issues to resolve one with each other, they decided to go speak to Yisrael the Malamed. So they would go to Yisrael and he would... And he, in his incredible godly uh, 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 thing that was dwelling, Ruach Hashem that was upon him, was able to give like Chach Mishleim, able to be able to resolve people's issues in a very, very special way. And obviously it created a very big, you know, reverence of the people. And people came to him, spoke to him. It so happened that Rebbe Ephraim, there was the father of Rebbe Gershon of Kitov, Rebbe Ephraim, he was one of the Choshev, he was maybe, maybe he, was the, he was the head of the base then, he was a very, very great scholar of scholar in the city of Brod. And he had some kind of a argument, some kind of a financial issue with a person in this town where the Baal Shem Tov was starting to become a little bit of an influencer. You would call it today's days an influencer. The Baal Shem Tov started becoming a little bit of a... And he had this issue with him. And they were arguing. And they knew that they needed to resolve it in front of a court. He was a huge Talmud Chacham. But, and he was going on his own. He probably knew the halacha, everything well. But you know, you can't pass in your own things when you have an argument. You have to go to someone. So this Rebbe Ephraim tells this Yid from that town, why don't you come to Brod, we'll go to the Beisden, and we'll have it out, me and you, in front of the Beisden. And this guy was stubborn, and he said, I'm not going to Brod. I have another place we can work it out. By us, this Yisrael, the Melamed, 
and he, he, he's really good at it. People are going to him and he's taking care of all of our things. Okay, Rabbi Ephraim abroad was not too excited about it. He didn't hear of this Yisrael to be a big rabbi. But you know what? He'll check it out. Maybe. So he came at that time to this town. I don't know again where the town was. Doesn't say. I'm relating the story as it is related in Sefer Shifchei HaBal Shem Tov, Which is a pretty reliable Sefer. So um, when he came to the town, the Baal Shem Tov saw Beruach HaKodesh, the Baal Shem Tov with his holy vision saw that this Rebbe Ephraim's daughter is meant to be his wife. See, this is the way you can cut out the Shatchan. Stand, you still need to pay the Shatchan. So the Baal Shem Tov knew exactly when he was 18 years old, knew exactly who is meant to be his wife. So uh, the Baal Shem Tov was excited to meet his future father-in-law. But he needed to, uh, you know, get him to like make the suggestion. So the Baal Shem Tov had his ways. And when this Rebbe Ephraim came, the Baal Shem Tov stunned him with a discussion on Lundis. Now usually the Baal Shem Tov played ignorant. Played such ignorant, Shein Kamayo. Like he was a boor, he doesn't know anything. He doesn't even know how to read a Pusik to heal him. Yet over here, the Baal Shem Tov knew that it's time to remove the mask a little bit. And the Baal Shem Tov had a discussion with this guy in, 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 in a Chiddush. The Baal Shem Tov told him an incredible Chiddush in Rambam or something. And Rabbi Ephraim was pretty blown. And they started talking back and forth. And he was impressed with him. Like, wow, this, he really knows back and forth. And, 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 and then, okay, so he was happy. The two of them came in front of the Baal Shem Tov, And the Baal Shem Tov resolved their issue in a very, 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 very insightful way. And he was getting more impressed. And he had more discussion. And he realized that the Baal Shem Tov was also a Baal Avedah, That he was also a very high spiritual person. He got that sense. So he inquired about this Yisrael. Who is he? He started asking. People said he's a Bachar. He's a Malamadir. And uh, he said he's a Bachar. Yeah, I'm not married. Okay. So he's close to the Baal Shem Tov And he says, listen here. I have a daughter. And maybe we do a Shidduch. He was so, he, was, he felt that this would be right for his daughter. According to the way the story says in Shifchei Baal Shem Tov, I think the version over here, I, I saw two versions, I'm not sure, that his daughter was actually married once, this, and she got divorced. So this daughter who was going to be the Baal Shem Tov's wife. So uh, again, this needs to be verified, but this is what I say. And anyways, he says to the Baal Shem Tov, maybe you want to, uh, maybe, you can, maybe we'd like to make a shidduch with me. So the Baal Shem Tov said to him, yes, However, a condition. He says, you know, I've been pre pretty popular in the town around over here. And a lot of, of the people who've been, I've been working for them as Malamid, and they support me, and so on and so forth, they had suggested Shaduchim for me with their daughters and so and so. And uh, if I suddenly am engaged just like this and dismiss them and just, uh, just took another Shidduch, it uh, it's not going to be good. And therefore, I need this to be quiet. No, the engagement has to be without anybody knowing about it. We'll do it quietly, me and you, and that's going to be the whole thing. And he said, another thing he says, if, you, if, you marry, if, if your daughter is going to marry me, if you're taking me as a son-in-law, I want you to take me, not my Torah, not my, not my pizzazz. I don't want you to be taking anything that you... Any, any, Anything about me, I want, you to be, I want your daughter to be marrying me. And therefore, in the Tanoim, in the, when, you're writing the, when we're writing the, uh, the, the engagement contract, there's no Reb, Harav, Harabani, Hamuflik, meaning the great scholar and genius and so on and so forth. All you put is Yisrael ben Eliezer. And if you agree to it, we have a deal. Okay, he was so excited. Where's he going to find a son like this? He has the whole thing written up and he puts down the Baal Shem Tov's name, Yisrael ben Eliezer, without any titles. And he puts his daughter's name. And that was that. Listen, I know it sounds strange, but that's the way things were done 300 years ago. There was no discussion with the girl, with the kala, with the this, the father. They, they, they used to make the arrangements. And fine. The, the, he leaves. He says, but I can't come yet because I got to stay here. I have to finish. I was hired. to fin I have to finish the, my contract as long as I'm supposed to stay over here. And then I'll come. Rabbi Ephraim is on his way home. And God has it the way, it, uh, the, way the story needs to be. Is that Rabbi Ephraim fell ill on his way home. And he fell ill and he never made it home. He passed away on his journey back to Brod. 
his son, Rebbe Gershon, and his other, everybody came, and, the, and they made a big levaya, and, after, and then Rebbe, his son, Rebbe Gershon, who was an incredible scholar, he was the head of the, he was the head of the, he was the head of the based in there in, in Broad. He was a genius. He used best, just to give you a sense of what kind of guy you're talking about, he's best friends with the Noi de Yehuda. So if anybody knows, Noi de Yehuda is one of the biggest paiskim in, 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 uh, of, of the Jew, uh, uh, he's a, he later became the rabbi of Prague. And he was the uh, halacha. It's like, it's like, you know, it's like Noi de Yehuda is, is, is one of the greatest of the great paiskim of all time. So he's best friends with the Neid de Yehuda. Rabbi Yonis and Ibshitz, you're talking about the greatest. They all speak of him like with incredible. He was also a huge Mekubal. You realize people would study, don't even realize that. The people, the, 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 the Tamid HaChacham in those days had tremendous knowledge both in Nigu and in Nister. Not everybody, but many of them. And Rabbi Yershon was a Mekubal as well. In any case, he comes... And after the Levaya, he's looking through his father's stuff, of course. And he finds this paper. And he can't believe what he's seeing. That his sister is engaged. And then he looks at this engagement. It's a Yisrael ben Eliezer. And he, and he says, who, did they, who is he she engaged to? Who did my? He had no idea, especially since they didn't send any titles. You know, because then they used to write. They knew how to write titles then. It was, that was the era of titles. I'm soon going to read to you a title that the Noi de Yehuda says about the Gershon of Kitov. So you're going to get a sense that when they wrote titles, they wrote titles. So he figured if his son-in-law was taking, if his father was a Goyen, was taking a son-in-law, he was going to write, a Goyen, a Muflik, here there's nothing, Yisrael ben Eliezer. And he, say, he has no idea who this Yisrael ben Eliezer is. Doesn't even say which town he's from. Weary, he doesn't know. He was very, so he tells his sister about the story that, by the way, Mazel Tov, you're engaged. And, and he says, but I don't know. It's very weird because we don't know who this guy is. And, and so she said, listen, I know, our, I know my father. And if my father made a shidduch with someone, I trust my father 100% that he's going to get me the, the, a, a bacher, someone who's, who, who, who I should be married to. And therefore, whoever it is, I'm in. This is what she, this is what she said. Okay. Time goes by. The Baal Shem to finished his... His, uh, his, uh, the, the season ended. The, what is it called? The school? Uh, the semester, yeah, it was over. And the Baal Shem Tev, it says to the, they, want, they were begging the Baal Shem Tev to stay. They wanted to renew the contract for a year, for another two years. And the Baal Shem Tev declined. He says, I have to leave. Instead of going back to his town, he made his way to Broad. Comes to Rebbe and he goes, and he dressed himself back up, no more like the Malamid when he was. He had a little bit of a sh- this. The Baal Shem Tev got back his, 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 his peasant uh, uh, big overcoat uh, and the thick belt that they used to wear, the, the farmers. And, 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 uh, and the Baal Shem Tev, uh, comes and he knocks on the house of Rebbe Gershon. And, he, and Reb Gershon is holding in the middle of uh, overseeing the, 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 the Beisden. Was, he was like on top of the Beisden. And he was overseeing the various different cases. And here there's someone by the door. So he thought he was just a schnorrer over here. So he sent him a doll. He gave him a coin. Uh, some uh, something for tzedak. In fact, you go on your way. So the Baal Shem says to him, no, I have something to talk to you about. <coughs> okay. The Yid says, the man, I have something to talk The way he said it with such assertiveness. So he turned and he says, okay, he says, I got to speak to you in, 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 in a closed office, in a closed room. So he goes in and uh, the Baal Shem Tev takes, the Baal Shem Tev also had a contract. They had copies. The Baal Shem Tev pulls out the contract of his engagement, the engagement starts to know him, and he presents it to him. He opens it up, but he knew already because he had the other copy. And he looks and he can't believe his eyes because now at least he was thinking, he was hoping that maybe for whatever reason this Yisrael ben Eliezer is like an unbelievable person. Maybe he's very humble, so he didn't let light writing titles for whatever reason, but he was sure that he would find that was a big ben Taira that would come who was worthy, and he took one look at him, and, 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 and he can see that he's not. And he was horrified. And the Baal Shem Tev said to him, like Yaakov said, Hava es ishti, give me my wife. <laughs> That's the Baal Shem Tev said. Get ahead the vibe. <laughs> And, and, and he, he said, oh. so he went to speak to her and he starts telling her, this is not a joke. This is terrible. You're going to bring an embarrassment on the entire family. You understand? That was always the issue. 
First taste, it was always the honor of the family. You're going to cause everybody, you're going to wear, wear the most lumdish family over here. You're gonna, and she said, if my father set this shidduch for me, then this is my, this is my husband. Anyways, she insisted, so Ger Reb Gershon had no, no choice, and he went along with it. He was very embarrassed, but he made the wedding, and uh, th I think there is a description regarding the wedding itself, but it's, I, I don't, I didn't come across it now. I remember hearing how the Balshem, the various different things that happened during that time, but whatever it was, um, after having the Balshem there for Sheva Brachas and seeing how incredible boorish, and, and the, but the Balshem made a said that he wants to talk to the Kala before the Chuf. And, and she went in and she spoke to the Balshem and to her the Balshem told everything. He said, you should know who I am uh, and I'm, I'm not what I'm pretending to be but I, am, I, am, it is the, I need to be concealed and hidden and I want you to know we're going to have a very difficult life. At least in the beginning. There's going to be a lot of hardship and are you in? But with the condition that she's not allowed to say a peep. She has to tr go along with the idea that she married a husband who knows nothing. And she agreed to it. And then they went to the chuppah. But afterwards, he couldn't, ins he he couldn't take the embarrassment. See, earlier it was just hypothetical. Now it became real. And he was so much, he was begging his sister to divorce him. Begging and begging. And the sister insisted, she's staying with the Baal Shem Tov. So he said, then, you know what? You can't stay over here. Leave town. So he sent them off. He got them a wagon, a horse to take them out of town and sent them off. Now there's, of course, different versions of what happened exactly where the Baal Shem Tov went. First, there were a couple of phases in the next stage of the Baal Shem Tov's life, but this is the first encounter of the Baal Shem Tov with Rabbi Gershon of Kitov in the, in the marriage of, of the Baal Shem, Tov's, Baal Shem Tov's daughter. What I will say is that... Um, a while later, during the time, I'm just going to share with you a few small stories that happened during the time that the Baal Shem Tov was still hidden from his brother-in-law and pretended to be who he was. They, they were so poor, by the way, they, they left and they, they, they moved into a place between two mountains and the Baal Shem Tov would go and he would dig, he literally would dig cement. And he, would, and he would put the cement in a wagon and he would schlep the cement and, his wa and together they would sell the cement and would make a few things. And But the Baal Shem Tov was happy because he was out in the forest fasting from Shabbos to Shabbos and uh, doing his doing his, his baididus, you know. The Baal Shem Tov was alone in his meditation and soaring in the higher worlds. And it's how he spent his days fasting. And uh, his wife was able to, you know, make a little bit of a living and that's how they managed to live in extreme poverty. But after a while, they did come back to, after a while, they made their way back. And they did come back to um, Broad. And Gershon asked his sister, how are things? She said to him that things were pretty rough. She told him how difficult their life is. So he says, I told you you should drop him. But um, she insisted that she's staying. But he had Rachmanis on them, and he said he's going to have them live next to him. And just he's going to keep him kind of in the background. And he was going to give the Baal Shem Tov a little bit of work to do for him. You know, maybe he'll figure out what kind of, what kind of things he can give him to do. So he was, the Baal Shem Tov was there for a while. One of the stories that happened during this time was, um, <laughs> these, these amazing stories. But it was that the, that the, the one time it was in Chalamoid, and the Baal Shem Tov used to come to davening, and he would... He, 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 the, the, east, the eastern, the Mizrach side is where all the Chashev Rabbanim would stand. And, you know, it would, the shul would go from east to west. And, and usually the simple people were in the back. But the Baal Shem Tov would stand in the front. And uh, so Rabbi Gershon kind of got, he was uncomfortable with his brother-in-law. But he was still, he was in the, fa the Chashev family, so he would stand there. And it was on Chalamoid, and the Baal Shem Tov was davening without his tefillin. So you know that Ashkenazim really wear tefillin on Chalamoid. During Chalamoid, Ashkenazim wear tefillin because the Ramah paskins that you're supposed to wear tefillin on Chalamoid. The Sfardim don't wear tefillin on Chalamoid. In the Zohar it says 
The Zohar says that if you wear tefillin on Chayel Chalamoid, on Chalamoid, very sharp, the Zohar says one is Chay of Misa for wearing tefillin on Chalamoid. <laughs> it's a very sharp. But you don't have to paskin like the Zohar. So the Rema, the Rema says in our countries we do wear tefillin on Chalamoid. The Beis Yosef paskins not to wear tefillin on Chalamoid. Now, the Baal Shem was obviously conducting himself according to Kabbalah. And the Baal, but it was not... In, in, in broad, everybody, this was before Hasidus, so everybody was wearing tefillin. So the Rabbi Gershon turns to his brother-in-law and says, where's your tefillin? So he said, I saw in a, in a sefer in Yiddish, they used to have, for the, for the, ignor, for the ignorant people, they had these, these svarim with basic halachas or things in Yiddish. Yeah, with that. And, and this, was, this was the old, the original article. This, the simple Yiddin would read only Yiddish. So he said, the Chabgizayin in Yiddish, and then this, and as Chalamod, you don't wear tefillin. So Rav Gershin got very angry. What are you, a and Shilas from a Yiddish Sefer? What, what's with, like, that, that's where you're getting this. Don't you, don't you see what everybody else is doing? So he said, you're going you're gonna to come with me to the Rav of the town, the Rav and the Kittiv, that, that, the Rav, and, his name was Ramosha. You'll come with me to the Rav, and we're going to, and we're going to straighten you out. So together they went to the rabbi's house, and, um, when Reb Geshen walked in, Reb Geshen put his hand on the mezuzah and he kissed the mezuzah. The Baal Shem Tov walked in behind him and the Baal Shem Tov put his hand on the mezuzah and then he didn't kiss the mezuzah. He just put his hand down. And Reb Geshen noticed and he said, what's with you? Why don't you kiss the mezuzah? And the Baal Shem Tov didn't answer. He says, so he said, Reb Geshen had something else, another pet peeve to, to deal with by the Rav, with this son, this brother-in-law of his. Anyways, when he came into the Rav, the Baal Shem Tev, this is the way the stories relate. The Baal Shem Tev removed the masve for a minute. The Baal Shem Tev removed his, his mask. And as he removed it, the Rav suddenly saw a lichte getzure, like he saw, he can see a tremendous light. And he stood up. He stood up like someone great came in. And then the Baal Shem Tev dropped his mask again. And he looked at him and he saw him as this, so he thought maybe he got a little, maybe he's hallucinating. So he sat back down. And then the Baal Shem Tev like, flipped it again and again he was like stop and it happened two or three times and then Reb Geshen, Reb Geshen wasn't noticing it the Rav was seeing it and the Rav was getting all tumult not knowing what the Baal Shem Tev what so the Rav then says to Reb Geshen, so says what's going on so Reb Geshen starts giving the complaint my brother-in-law he, he, he's, he's, he has to be told that he has to do what others do and if he has a Shaila he should ask a Talmud Chacham he shouldn't go take, not, not read just the pamphlet over there and paskin himself, Shilas. He wasn't wearing tefillin and he, and he didn't kiss the mezuzah when he walked down. I don't know why, why he doesn't, you know, everybody kisses the mezuzah. He puts, so a little bit more refined he has to behave. So the rabbi says to the Baal, so he says, okay, I'll speak to him. He calls the Baal Shem Tov into a closed room and he said, don't mess with me. <laughs> Stop it. Tell me what's going on. And the Baal Shem Tev did reveal himself to him. And the Baal Shem Tev did say to him that I have a gazeta that I have to be, I have to be hidden. And uh, so he came back and he said, and so why didn't you kiss the mezuzah? He says, I don't wear, I don't wear uh, tefillin because of you're not supposed to wear tefillin on Chalamoid. And uh, the reason I didn't kiss the mezuzah is because the, tefillin, was the mezuzah's puzzle. So the Rav had the mezuzah checked and of course it was puzzle. Uh, not yet. In any case, the Rav comes back out and tells Reb Gershin, you know, I spoke to him. He, he's a fine person. You know, leave him alone. He, he seems to be, you know, he's, 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 he just, just let him do his thing. He, he's a fine idiot. Okay. So he left. Now one time, the Baal Shem Tov wanted a Zoyar, also from that period of time. The Baal Shem Tov w um, wanted a, a Sefer HaZoyar. So he's going to get a Sefer HaZoyar. So he went to the Rav to borrow a, a, a Sefer HaZoyar. And the Rav gave him a Sefer Azayah. On the way home, on the way back home, <laughs> he meets Reb Gershon coming on a wagon. And Reb Gershon sees his brother-in-law and he sees he's hiding something. So he says, what are you hiding? So he says, nothing. So the guy says, no, you're hiding something. And Reb Gershon jumps off and he, and, he, and, he, and he wrestles it out and he pulls out. And he sees he's holding a Zayah. He says, you need this? What's with you? He was really upset at him. He said, and he and he took the zayar and he said, "You go. You know, you know, you can't hold this." So and he, and he, and he whatever he took it back to the rabbi and he gave him the zayar and fine. 
So a little while later, the Baal Shem Tov was in the in the in, by during davening. Um, by in in the in the shul, and um, the rabbi heard that in the middle of Shemayna Esrei or the beginning of Shemayna, the Bolshemtiv let let out a very deep krechts, a very deep moan. So after davening, he went over to him and he said to him, "What what were you krechtsing about?" The Rav, not Reb Gersh, he went over to the Baal Shem Tov and he said, what are you krechtsing about? Why are you, why are you krechtsing? And the Baal Shem Tov tried to dismiss it, that he's krechtsing, nothing. He tried to, he says, no, 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 I realized that that was a real sigh from something very deep. What was that krechts? So the Baal, again, this is what, so the Baal Shem Tov said, there is a mezuzah over here in the shul that's puzzle, next to the door, the Baal Shem Tov was standing next to the door that's puzzle, and it doesn't let me daven. It wasn't letting me daven, and that was disturbing me. So therefore, I krechts him. So then the Rav said to him, uh, your brother-in-law bought me the Zoya. The Rav gave him the Zoya back. And the Rav said to the Baal Shem Tov, I'm giving you a bracha not to meet your brother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> so n- not to meet his brother-in-law. So um, During that time, just the stories that were very interesting during the time that the Baal Shem Tov was hidden, I, 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 um, give me a second here. I jotted them down to remember stories here. Give me a second here. Ah. There was a woman, this is a funny story. There was a woman in, in, in uh, I guess it either was in the town of Kitiv or it was in the place in Brod, which the woman was a little bit of a, she had a spirit that went into her. Used to have a lot of debukim, people who had. And this woman, what she used to do is, every time anybody would come into her, she would immediately be able to tell because she was an ashama that was inside of her that can see things. So she would right away say everything about that person. She would like, you know, and people... If people were like really tzaddikim or great people, she would say, ooh, ha tzaddik, ha this. If people were a little this, she called out people on different things. So Reb Gershon uh, figured that it would be good if, this, if, the, if, if, if his brother-in-law gets taken in front of this woman, so she'll, uh, she'll straighten him out a little bit. So she asked that someone, the rabbi of this, the rabbi of the town should take him to this to this woman that, that does the, uh, that can see. So the Baal Shem Tov, she, the, the Baal Shem Tov comes in, and first the rabbi comes in, so she says, Sholem, Ubracha, Harav, Agoyen, she says to him, to the Rav. And then a few other people had come in, and she said all kinds of things. And then she sees the Baal Shem Tov, and she says, Srulik, she says, Rabbi Yisrael, she says, Rabbi Yisrael, she says, she says, Rabbi Yisrael, I'm not afraid of you. This is what she said. Rabbi Yisrael, I'm not afraid of you. Because I know that until you're 36 years old, you can't use Seamus. That in heaven, they don't let you use your spiritual powers until you reach the age of 36. So you can't mess with me. So the Baal Shem Tov tried to ignore it and make like uh, whatever. But she was, she was commanding. So the Baal Shem Tov went over to her. And he said, listen here, if you're not quiet... He says, I'm going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to make, I'm going to sit a bezin down and I'm going to be matter my, 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 I'm going to suspend my, my gazeta upon me and I'm going to chase you out. The neshama, when the shamas are inside someone, it's because they go there for protection. Because they're having a hard time up being without a body and for whatever reason, because of sins that they've done and they're, 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 so they go into a body to get some... Pr- that's the story of all the Dibukim. If you know the stories of Dibukim, it's always because they go there for... The Baal Shem Tov warned her that he's going to kick the... that he's going to get her out. The people overheard the Baal Shem Tov saying this to her, so they, so they, they said to the Baal Shem Tov, no, 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 no. Do it, get it, get, get it done. She, she was upset, obviously. And the Baal Shem Tov did speak to her, and the Baal Shem Tov said to the Dibuk, or the whatever it was, and the Shami said, you know, I can extract you, but... I'm asking you to leave Bechesed Uberachemim. Just leave on your own. And that's what happened. Um, that was one of, the, one of the stories that happened during the time that the Bolshemta was hiding himself.
Um, Let's sing some Nigunim. <laughs> And thank you for all the Malava Malkas this year that we had, sponsored by the Tzikman family. A very big bracha to you and to your whole family. And all the tzaddikim should give tremendous blessings. Chaim al-Bracha. Toiva nirva nigla. 
And thank you everyone for coming and joining us. We have some really, really special stories. Um, since we're talking about the time that the... I have, we have quite a lot of stories about Reb Gershon later in his life, and which I would like to get to, but since we're talking about this time, when the Baal was still hidden, um, I'll, 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 we'll, 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 we'll stay to this at, this at this particular time. So what happened was, during the time that the Baal was not living next to Reb Gershon, and he was out somewhere, it was a, it was a period of time Again, this was the time that the Baal Shem Tov was graced to study with the great, great, great tzaddik, Achia Hashiloini, the one who was in the Beisdin of David HaMelech and was Makabal the Torah from David HaMelech and later became the Rebbe of Elio Anavi. And he revealed himself to the Baal Shem Tov while the Baal Shem Tov was in Brod, right after his wedding, I think that during that period of time, when he was together with Reb Gershon, that's when he got this visit from Achia Shaloni, who told him to come out the next day to toivel himself in the mikveh. He had no idea who it was. He tried to ignore the dream. And then he came to him a few times and he said, you better come out and meet me. And he went out into the play, into the, into the, but, but, but Laman Hashem, make sure to be toivel yourself in the mikveh four times before you come. And he went and he was in a cave and for an entire year, actually 10 years, or was one year? No. How long did they study? The Baal Shem Tov learned to an Achi Ashiloini. But in any case, during, what, during this certain period of time that the Baal Shem Tov was hidden after his marriage, he uh, came before Pesach, and him and his wife did not have any money for matzahs. They didn't have any money for Pesach at all. So the Baal Shem Tov decided it needed to go do something. So he went out to the surrounding towns as a shaykhit to shecht and of came the people bought the chickens with that he was able to make a little bit money and um, he was able to either purchase or the people gave him flour for Pesach and meat and he came back after his I don't know how long he was away but he came back with all this uh, with the wagon and he tells his wife that um, if she, he, he Baal Shem Tov was, you know, was taken away from his high avoid in, the, in his dveikus and all that, so he wanted to rush back to his own private affairs. So he told his wife, I brought you the wagon with, all the, with, the, with, the, with the flour for the matzah, uh, make sure to take it in the house. She couldn't schlep it herself, so she needed to find help. Someone should come help her. By the time she found help, it started raining, and the flour got wet. The flour gets wet, um, it's, it's the chametz, it's not good. So the whole thing got ruined. When her husband came home, she felt terrible. And she told the Baal Shem Tov that the whole thing was ruined. What was Baal Shem Tov gonna do? He makes us, so he, 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 was, he made rounds in these villages, he went to the other side, in the other direction, and made rounds in the other villages, and again did the shechitas and all, of the shechting and all that. Put together some more money, managed to get, and this time when he was coming back, he was schlepping, the, he was coming with the wagon and the horse died as it was a very, it was a high, it was a high incline. But the horse had to schlep the wagon. The horse was having a very hard time and then the horse just collapsed and it died and the Baal Shem Tov was left with the wagon. Now the Baal Shem Tov was afraid to leave the wagon because or else it wouldn't be matzah shmura. He needs it to be shmura matzah and he was, and you have to have a shimer there. And for that reason, he was, didn't want to leave to go find someone, get a new horse, get a new hitch. So the Baal Shem Tev himself stood and started schlepping and schlepping and schlepping. And as he was pulling up the mountain with this wagon, and this, uh, he collapsed on the floor. And he was without koiches. And he thought he's just going to pass. These. And uh, he was crying. The Baal Shem Tev started crying. He said, Eibish, hey, I, ma I need matzahs for Pesach. He was so overworked and so exhausted. And this is already the second time he's finally getting. And as he's crying, he falls asleep. And in his sleep, Elio Anavi appears to him. And Elio Anavi says to him, he says, he says, Yisrael, you know, your tefillahs were heard on high. And your prayers were 
were this. And, and he says, and you're answered. I'm going to send you someone, a Gentile who's going to come by, and he's going to help you with your wagon, and uh, things will be good. So the, as soon as the Baal Shem Tov woke up, a guy comes passing by uh, uh, on a wagon, and he asks, and he, and he sees him over there, and he says, do you need a hitch? Do you want to hitch on to my wagon? So the guy came out, and he was really good at it, and he knew how to hitch him up. And the fellow came, and he hitched the Baal Shem Tov's wagon to his wagon, and um, he went. So now, um, when he gets, the, oh, this, this Gentile, when he gets to the, to the place, and he takes the flower and he makes sure to put it away from matzah, everything. The, this guy he says to the Baal Shem Tov, he says, should I, how much would you pay me if I skin the horse, the dead horse? I guess you can do something with the hide. So the Baal Shem Tov says, I'll give you a, 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 a it was called a zexer. A zexer was a, it was a little coin, it was nothing much. And the guy said, okay, I'll do it for that. He went back and he skinned the horse and he took and he brought the, the, the hide of the horse back to the Baal Shem Tov. Okay. And, the, and a little while right after that, someone comes to town over there and he meets and he says to the Baal Shem Tov, and he sees this and he says, how much are you selling that for? The Baal Shem Tov tells him four gold, four rendlach, which was a, was a significant, it was a... It was a Okay, so the Baal Shem Tov had now a, a, a nice bit of money that he got from this, that the guy, because he bought it at, at no cost, he sold it at no cost, and now, I'm sorry, he bought it at no cost, and he sold it at a pretty profit. So he gave the money to his wife, and he said to his wife, oh, and, the, and, this, and this guy, said, who, the, this Gentile who came and brought him the thing, says to the Baal Shem Tov, um, says to his wife, uh, yeah, it was the Baal Shem Tov, he says, you should get yourself clothing for Yom Tif. So obviously, you can see that it was a Psalio Anavi, and so you can get you for, you, and, for you and your husband, he says. You should buy new clothing for Yom Tif. Just a little bit after that, um, people came and they were selling um, certain furs. Furs, or I don't know what kind exactly material it was. And she now had money to buy, and she can have it made. So she, she went sending to the Baal Shem Tov, asking her husband if she should buy the, she, if she can buy the, these, these, these animal hides or whatever it was. And this was, the, in other words, the, what the horse's hide she couldn't make clothing from. But from this she could, so she asked. So the Baal Shem Tov, I didn't understand what the Shaila was. It seemed like it was some kind of a Shaila she had. And the Baal Shem Tov said, don't worry, it's Hefker. Because maybe what happens, maybe it was from thieves who attacked people and they, they came to sell their wares. So they asked the Baal Shem Tov, she asked, and the Baal Shem Tov said it's Hefker because the people who owned it or whatever were, were killed. So you can buy it. So she bought it and she made the Baal Shem Tov a nice pelts for, for Pesach. And she was also able to make for herself and nice clothing. So for Shyamtiv, they had nice Yamtiv clothing. Now, at, during that time, they were working, the Reb Gershon had set them up in an inn, that they have their own inn, a, a place where, where they sold whiskey. They had a bar and they sold a tavern like they used to have. They had a krechma. She was So when suddenly the, the owner of the town, the owner of the area, and it owned the inn, uh, saw him wearing suddenly such nice clothing. These were expensive clothing. And he knew the Baal Shem Tov shouldn't be able to support, sh shouldn't be able to have afforded something like that. So he calls the Baal Shem Tov and he says, I see that you're cheating on me, that you must have been buying your whiskey from someone else other than me and selling it. And because you bought someone else, you bought it at a lower price. And the Baal Shem Tov says, it's not true. I haven't bought anything from anybody else. We only buy from you. So he says, that can't not be. He says, because if you're only from me, you wouldn't have money for your clothing. I see you're wearing such, such this, this, that you have such, to buy yourself such clothing. It's impossible you were able to uh, get it, make the money. And he, and he, and he, uh, so the Baal Shem Tov said, that's not true. So the guy, the person, how did they get into the inn? 
because Reb Gershon had arranged. Reb Gershon needed to find somewhere to put his brother-in-law. So Reb Gershon had, an, had, had, an, had, had arranged this. So this guy went back to Reb Gershon. He said, listen, I, 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 you know, we're in good terms. You sent me your brother-in-law. I'm taking care of him. But he's undercutting me. He's going and he's buying uh, from, other, from other buyers. And he's... Uh, so um, Reb Gershon said, listen, when next time he comes to town, and he says, if he doesn't stop... If he doesn't stop, I'm going to have him, I'm going to have him uh, thrown into the arrested. I'm going to have him arrested and I'm going to have him beaten. This is what he said. I'm going to have him arrested and I'm going to have him beaten. Okay, so the Rebgeshen said, my, my brother-in-law comes, I'll take it up with him, I'll, I'll already speak to him. So when the Baal Shem Tov came back, whenever it was, to, to where Reb Gershon was, he, Reb Gershon asked him about it. What's with this new clothing that you had? Would you, he said to me that, the Baal Shem Tov said, I didn't, I didn't, uh, that's not true. We never, we, we, were, we only sell the spirits that we get from them. We don't get from anyone else. So he says, but how do you have money to, to, for, for, to, for, you, to, for you and your wife to get such, such uh, more expensive clothing? So the Baal Shem Tov says, the Ebishter had gave me. The Ebishter gave me. So the Gershon said, how come the Ebishter doesn't give me? So the Baal Shem Tov says, he gave me and he didn't give you. <laughs> so, uh, and so he said, but the guy warned that he's going to have you beaten and thrown in. Balshamta says, I'm not scared. I'm not scared of him. So actually what happened was that this guy, I think this fellow that was threatening the Balshamta of whatever, or passed away, yeah. In any case, this was one, one of the stories that is known during that time. And also, before he set him up in the inn, before he set the Baal Shem Tov up in this inn, what happened was, remember I said when they came back after seven years, he told the, Baal, he told the, the couple, stay with me and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you, I'm going to find some work to do. Maybe you'll become the Shamish for the Bezden. You're going to call people. You're going to be my handyman. When Reb Gersh needed to travel somewhere, he decided to take his brother-in-law and make him his coachman, make him his balagola. So the Baal Shem Tov became, went and was, they went on their first trip. And the Baal Shem Tov was on the, leading the horses. And the Baal Shem Tov led the horses into a really, really good swamp. And the horses got stuck together with the thing and Rav Gershon got very annoyed. And, and, they, and, 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 um, so the Baal Shem Tov says, you know, let me go to town. I'll find, a go I'll find somebody to come, a tow truck, to come and help us tow us out. So the guy looks and he says, with the, you know, this guy, I'm going to let him go. He's going to get lost. Who knows where he's going. He, 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 not only didn't he think the Baal Shem Tov, but he thought the Baal Shem Tov was a little bit, a little, a little bit off. So he says, I'm going to go. I'm going to go get help. So he left and he went to, and he slept through the mud and he got all dirty. And finally he was able to come to town and got, got whoever needed to help and he's coming back. Meanwhile, the Baal Shem Tev, as soon as he left, the Baal Shem Tev got the horses and everything out instantly. And as he's coming with his whole helpers that are coming, the Baal Shem Tev comes riding on the horse with him. So he says to his brother, Shru, how'd you, what did you do? How'd you get out of there? He said, what's haste? I gave him ein schmitz. I gave one thing and we got out. So he was, he was a, so he, he said, hey, this guy, I would think he would be impressed. Now he has a balagala, but he guess he said, such a take to garnish, he says. Not only, I can't have him learning he doesn't know. Yeah. And, 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 and even as a balagala, teigenisht. So he needed, that's when he set him up that his wife should run the inn and let the Baal Shem Tov do whatever he will do. So I'll conclude with another amazing story which comes about when the Baal Shem Tov began his revelation. And it was also with a student of Reb Gershon. A Talmud of Reb Gershon. Reb Gershon was a huge scholar, as I mentioned. And he had Talmidim. One of his Talmidim came to visit him once in the city of Brod. And after his visit, on his way home, Reb Gershon set up, Reb Gershon set up that he should, since his way home was passing through where his sister lived. So he, he set him up that he should stay by his sister. For, for the night to lodge there. So he came, this Talmud, and he was there. And um, 
he knew that the Bolshemtiv's brother-in-law, this Talmud knew the story. The Bolshemtiv's brother is an ignoramus. So he, 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 when, when the Bolshemtiv came home, he speaks to him a little bit, and the Bolshemtiv said to him, "No, maybe you stay for Shabbos. Maybe you stay for me for Shabbos." And he was just, he wasn't interested. So he said, "No, no, I gotta leave. I gotta go." So he. The next day, he when he when he left, um, one of the he, one of the axles on the horse broke. So he came back and he got it fixed, and when it got it fixed, and they left the second time, and again something broke, so they had to schlep it back. So he didn't end up going. It was like on Tuesday that he was there. Then he didn't go back going on Wednesday. So now this was already the next day on Thursday. He tried to leave, and again all kinds of stuff were happening. And every time he tried to get out of there, he couldn't. And he realized that he's going to be stuck over here by him for Shabbos. He sees that the wife of the Baal Shem Tov is preparing 12 chalas. Now he knew, according to Kabbalah, the Mekubalim used to have 12 chalas. So he says to her, who are you making 12 chalas for? She said, my husband is not a, he's not a, he's not a, so, so he doesn't know how to learn, but he's still a fine yid. And my brother has 12 chalas. So we have 12 chalas as well. Okay. He says to her, is there a place to go bathe here? She says, oh yeah. We have a merchitz. We have a, a place to wash. And we also have a mikveh. And she sa he says, why do you need a mikveh here? Like for, like, a, uh, she said, um, yeah, my husband goes to the mikveh every day. He said, he goes to the mikveh every day? He says, yeah, my husband is a fine year. His tables, it, was not, it, was not the, it was not something that people did those days. Like the Chassidus brought the idea that people should go to the mikveh every day. Well, tzaddikim were doing it, but not fine. Comes Friday night, and he's, 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 he's doing his Kabbalah. This Rav asks her, where is your husband? To, ready close to Kabbalah Shabbos. Because he wants to do at least Kabbalah Shabbos with him, maybe, you know. He says, nah, he's outside with the goats and the sheep. Oh, calm down, you can do your thing. So he's davening there. And the Baal Shem Tov was doing his dveikos, whatever it was. And then the Baal Shem Tov comes home. And the Baal Shem Tov walks in and goes over to the corner, pretending that he's davening quickly. Because he had davened already, but he pretends that he davens very quickly. And then he comes to the table, and the Balshamtiv knew that if the Balshamtiv will make Kiddush, then this guy will see. So the Balshamtiv figured, you know, let him say Kiddush, he'll be Maitzah. So he offered his guest to say Kiddush, and the guest said Kiddush, and the Balshamtiv just. And the Balshamtiv sat with his wife, just like together. Like, the way they say the story is not, not that this was, this was like the simple Yidin. Like the simple Yidin was sitting side by side with his wife. And the other was, and the, the rabbi, and the uh, was there. And in the middle of the of the thing, the Baal Shem Tev asked him, "No, Zugatayra, say say some say something." And this person is thinking, "Okay, what are these guys? They don't know anything." It was Pasha Shemoyz, I think. So he starts telling them the whole story, what happened with Yitzis Mitzrayim, like they never heard the story, and he's telling them the Yidn were in Mitzrayim and and, and and this, and he tells the Gansa, Ma'isa, very bepashtas. Simple, and this is the story. Fine. Baal Shem Tov's listening. Fine. The next day, the story, he goes out. No, wait, wait. So it wasn't, no. Middle of the night, this is what happened. The guy went to sleep, and the Baal Shem Tov had also seemed to have gone to sleep, when suddenly, in the middle of the night, he wakes up, and he sees that on top of the stove, there's a huge fire. And he jumps up in horror. And he goes running because he wants to extinguish the fire. And as he gets close, he realizes this is, this is, a, this is a heavenly fire. This is not, this is a sneh boya be'esh. This is not a regular, this is not. And he, and he, and he sees the Baal He saw and he, got, and he got very scared. And he went back. He ran back to where he was. And the next morning, he meets the Baal And the Baal said, don't look where you're not supposed to. So he was a little, he was confused because the Baal again looked so regular. So he was confused. He was sure what happened. Was he dreaming last night? 
Shabbos by day, I forgot what happened by the meal. There was also an interaction. The Baal Shem Tov, I think, asked him to say Torah. He said Torah. The Baal Shem Tov said a different pshat in it, and he was a little taken aback. But when it came to Shalosh the Baal Shem Tov just... That's right. And the Baal Shem Tov started speaking Torah like straight from Gan Eden. And it was Himalish Torah. It was Razen de Razen. And this, 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 this Yid was a... The Baal Shem Tov chose to, to reveal himself to this Yid. He must have been someone that was Shaykh to something. And this Yid was, he couldn't believe it. And then after Shabbos, he, he said to the Baal Shem Tov, like, what do we do? And the Baal Shem Tov said to him, I want you to go back to Broad. I want you to gather people over there and tell them, don't speak to my brother-in-law. Just go back to the people and tell them that you saw a big light in the neighborhood. And that's it, something like that. And, you, and, they, and, they, and, and they should know that there is a big light in the neighborhood. So uh, the people in Broad, when he told them that, they, 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 and he, they, they knew who he was. He wasn't a, 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 young, a, an Irish guy. And he started telling them this, so they got, so they, they all decided to go out to be Makabal Panim, the Baal And they went out, and the Baal Shem Tov said Torah for them. And that kind of started the revelation of the Baal Shem Tov, um, at that time. So these are the stories with Rav Gershon and the Holy Baal Shem Tov. But just to give you a, 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 a sense of, Rabbi, of, of who Rav Gershon himself is on his own right, I'm just going to conclude before we take a break, I'll tell you a really cute story. That later in the town of Brod, when the, when the Rav Gershon was already a chassid, one time it was on Sukkis, and in Brod, there was a great Goyen. His name was Reb Chaim Tzanzer. He was one of the biggest misnagdim to Hasidus. Obviously, this is the first generation. So the Balshemta's name is beginning to get around town. And there are those who are going to check him out and fall in love with him. And there are those who are like keeping a distance and even like getting nervous with him. Reb Chaim Tzanzer was the head of the Kloys of Brod. And he was a Goyen Adir a genius of geniuses, and he was very against the Baal Shem Tov. It so happened that it was Sukkis, and he was sitting in his sukkah, and it was, and, and, and it was, and it was the first night of Sukkis, and it started raining, like it rained today in the morning here. And it was raining as like well, cats and dogs, it was pouring. And Reb, and Reb Tzchaim Tzandu was in a lot of tsar that he can't do the mitzvah of Sukkah. It was the first night Sukkis, he's supposed to sit in a sukkah more than any other night, and he wanted to sit in a sukkah and he couldn't sit in a sukkah. And he was very bothered. Suddenly someone comes by and he says to him that I was in town and I'm coming from Reb, Gershon, Reb Gershon's sukkah and Reb Gershon is sitting in a sukkah and in his sukkah it's not raining. So Reb Chaim was, ooh. So he, Reb Chaim sends his son to go check if it's true. So his son goes and comes back a half an hour later and he says that it's true. The whole, everywhere it's pouring. Reb Gershon is sitting in his sukkah with his family and he's staying tighter. He says, Lichtik, and there's a drop of rain on his sukkah. It's not raining. So Reb Chaim hears, okay, and he sits with his son in the, maybe they had, I don't know if they were, they said, they were, I, don't know if they, I don't know if, oh no. So they were still sitting in the sukkah in the rain, very, very, and Reb Chaim starts talking about these, these people. They play hocus pocus. They have their crazy things. The Baal Shem Tov, and now his brother-in-law. Anyways, he's sitting and talking and talking about how this is against halacha and it's against traditional Judaism. And he's talking and talking away for, for a long time with his upsetness. He doesn't. And then the next morning, he's go, he was he was he, he, he meets who does he meet? He meets Reb Gersh, and both of them are going to the mikvah to prepare for shaking the lulav. As he, as he meets Reb Gershon, Reb Gershon looks at him, and Reb Gershon says, a Yid sits in the sukkah and talks Lashon Hara in the sukkah? We can, how can a Yid sit and talk Lashon Hara in a sukkah? So Reb Chaim looks at him, and Reb Chaim says, well, besides me and my son, no one was in my sukkah to hear the Lashon Hara. So who told you? He says, the only one that could have told you is a malach. Can a malach speak Lashon Hara? So how, so a malach speaks Lashon Hara? So Reb Gershon said to him, 
You know it says that when you do a mitzvah, you create a mitzvah, your malach. And when you speak, do an aveda, you create a malach. So the malach that you created by speaking Lashon Hara, he was the malach who came to tell me Lashon Hara. <laughs> the malach that you created that said the Lashon Hara, he came to tell me the Lashon Hara. Yeah, Rav yeah. was a, a holy yid, a Baal Ruach HaKodesh, a very, I, it was hidden from him who the Baal Shem Tov was in the early stages. Just to show you that later he, the Baal Shem Tov brought him to Mezhebush, he became the tutor for the Baal Shem Tov's son, Reb Tzvi. He, used to, he taught Reb Tzvi Torah. And, and, and the main story about Reb Gershon is that he went off to Eretz Yisrael. He was the one who, who was the, one of the first people who brought Hasidus to Eretz Yisrael, but we're going to talk about that after um, we say L'chaim. L'chaim L'bracha.
Pesci. I mentioned earlier, just to get it, to get a little bit of an understanding of who these people were. See, that's also when people, when you hear these stories of the Baal Shem Tov, sometimes people think, ah, there was like, you know, some, some interesting makubal, he was doing some really cool things, and he, if his brother-in-law was Rav Gershon of Kitav, became his chassid Nimratz, and he was best friends with the Noid of Yehuda, and you're going to see in a moment what the Noid of Yehuda wrote on him, you realize that you, you're dealing with people that, people that were themselves on incredible levels. And when they became like an Eved, he became like a total Eved Neman to the Baal Shem Tov. It just gives you an understanding that he realized that the Shechina has enclosed itself in the Holy Baal Shem Tov. That's the idea of it. We're talking about a level of godliness that's like unparalleled. That's why these biggest Ga'inim became Batal and Mavutal to the Baal Shem Tov. So here, of course, in the beginning, the Baal Shem Tov was playing games. But when once the Baal Shem Tov was revealed and, and, and really revealing who, who he is and what he is. So just to show you, Rabbi Yonis and Ibshitz writes to him, this is his title to him, Harava Chassid, the teacher, the pious one, Hara, the rabbi, the pious one, Hamafursim, the famous one, Hamuflik B'Tayra, who is genius in Torah, Umakubal Eloki, and a godly Makubal. This is Rabbi Yonis and Ibshitz's title to him. Rabbi, the Noi de Yehuda, it goes like this. Mahmad Ainai, the, 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 this is in the Chuvis. You can, you can look it up in Naidi Behuda, Madura Kama, Evan Ezra, Simonai, Gimel. This is the same Naidi Behuda that all the, you know, Naidi Behuda himself wrote against the Chassidim. <laughs> but here he writes to Rav Gershon Kittav, these are the words. Mahmad Ainai, the precious of my eyes, the Chemdas Libi, and the desire of my heart. Bar Pachsi Uberivi, I don't even know what that means. Chacham Adif Minavi, a wise man who is greater than a prophet. Layish Velavi, a lion. He is the, the, the honorable, my honorable friend. Yedid Nafshi, my, 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 my Yedid, my, my soul b- uh, b- buddy. Vechavivi, and my love. Ohuv Lamato, one that is beloved below. Venechmad Lamaila, and he's precious above. Harabani Hamufla, the wondrous rabbi. Umuflig B'Toyra of Chasidus. And is 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 like on levels beyond in Torah and Chasidus and piety. Loi eser yadais to him is ten hands, ten measures usually that means. Shushan soidais, great secrets. Hachacham hasholim hakoil vahakoilel, the wise man who who's who's perfect and is all inclusive. Chasida kadisha, the holy Chasid. Neri Yisrael, the lamp of Israel. Amud hayamini. The right, the right p- p- pillar. Patish Achazak. Kvoid Marenu Arav Avram Gershon. These are lines and lines and lines. This is how he's speaking to the, to the, to the Gershon Kittiver. So you, 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 the Noi de Yehuda did not write titles just like this. You can see that this is on a different level. In any case, just to understand who Rabbi Gershon is. But now, um, just a little story about the later life about, about Rabbi Gershon himself and some amazing stories about him. So uh, there was a time that um, the, the Chachamim and Eretz Yisrael were beginning to hear about the Baal Shem Tov and they decided to send, they decided to, and they heard that, this, that, that, there's, that there is a, a tzaddik who's supposed to be an extraordinary miracle worker and he's doing incredible things and he seems to be starting some kind of a new, a new movement in the Jewish people. And uh, that's right. And people were scared it was a cult, a new movement, especially after the Shapsi Tzvi that happened not recent, pretty recent before the Baal Shem Tov. And therefore they were a little nervous. And they decided to send a Mishlachas, three of their greatest rabbis in Yerushalayim, to check out the Baal Shem Tov, to scan them out. They took three tzaddikim of Yerushalayim and they sent them across to go visit Poland. Maybe they, I'm sure they had to come back with some fundraising too. And uh, to go check out the Baal Shem Tov. And the three of them came and they arrived at Erev Rosh Hashanah. And their job was as follows. One of them was appointed to look at the Baal Shem Tov. The other one was to check out his brother-in-law, the Gershon, Gershon of Kitov, because they were saying things about him as well. And the third one was supposed to look at just the Hanagah of the students of the Baal Shem Tov, the rest of the Chevra. So again, they appointed someone special on Reb Gershon, on the Baal Shem Tov. 
So it happened so, this is already a measure bush. The Baal Shem Tov, um, Rosh Hashanah, they were very happy. They saw the Avoid of the Baal Shem Tov, they were very nispoiled. They were very, Aseris Yemei Tshuva, they were, they, they were impressed. It came Yom Kippur, so it came, the Baal Shem Tov sent Reb Gershon to be the Chazan for Ne'ila on Yom Kippur. His brother-in-law, Reb Gershon, was sent to be the Chazan by Ne'ila on Yom Kippur, the last prayer, the highest prayer. In general, in, in, in the, in, if you look in the, in the Chachmei Brod, in the Klois, they have papers from them. Over there it says that Reb Gershon was the Chazan in the weekdays, all the time. In the, he was the, because he had a koile orev, he had a very sweet voice. And the Baal Shem Tov sent him to Davin Ne'ila. When he went up to Ne'ila, before he started davening, he took a snuff box, and he took some snuff, and he, and he, and he, and he inhaled the snuff, like in Yerushalayim, in those days, no one was doing that, and they thought it was a little bit out of place for someone to, on a such stature, to be busy on such a holy moment, and, and uh, busy with physical pleasure, kind of. They thought of it as, 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 as having a sudden attachment to physicality. And these were big tzaddikim, and they expected that someone was going to be the chazan by Ne'ila on Yom Kippur, the peak is the highest time. So the one that was watching the, the Reb Gershon was particularly watching him and looking after him, thought to himself, eh. And as he had that thought, the Baal Shem Tov realized that this was when he, see, we don't realize how much when we pass judgment on people it has an effect in heaven. And being especially this person was a tzaddik. So it, it caused a kitrug on this person that he was supposed to die because he had a judgment on Reb Gershon and that it was going to harm Reb Gershon as well. I'm not sure if it was, I don't remember if it was to him also, because he, he should have been careful and not being, and not creating an, a, a, such a thing on him. So yeah, an accusation. So the Balshemta was very bothered by it, but he, and Balshemta saw this happening. So the Balshemta waited, and it was the night of Ashana Rabbah. Already, so after, they spent Sukkot there as well. And it came towards the Shana Rabbah, and these tzaddikim deci de decided that they were going to do the, the, the big tikkunim that the Mukubalim do on Ashana Rabbah by night. And they prepared themselves for the tikkun. And the Baal Shem Tov cast upon them a very, 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 a, a very strong sleepiness and tiredness. So when they tried to keep, no matter what they tried to do, to keep themselves awake, they couldn't keep awake. And they were, they were fighting and they felt that they're going to just fall asleep and it was bothering them because they knew it's a holy night and they, it's not, you're not supposed to sleep that night. But their sleep was coming over them. And what happened was someone in the shul, not them, someone else was passing around snuff. And because they realized that they were falling asleep and they needed something, so they grabbed a little, so they, they too took a little snuff and they, and they, and they, and the Balshemtov had infused in the snuff that there should be over there. That's, that's what the story I read. He, he affected that the snuff should have a, a smell of Gan Eden. So when they took the snuff and they gave a shrek, it created such a, like a spiritual boost and it woke them up and it created such an expansiveness in their mind. And suddenly the student was thinking to himself, he had the thought, he says, ah, I never knew that this is so powerful. <laughs> so he says, and that's probably why the Baal Shem Tov's brother-in-law took, took a little of this stuff, um, took a little, like they said, a little chashish right before, <laughs> right before, right before Ne'ilah. And with that, with that little thought that he, that he, that he, kind of, he, he exonerated the Baal Shem Tov, the whole thing was fixed. That was the story with the snuff. Another very, very amazing story was Reb Gershon had gone to Eretz Yisrael and he was there for quite a few years, but it seems like he came back one time. If, according to the story. Again, you read stories, you don't know exactly which, what exactly, because there's all kinds of stories. But it seems like from this story that he came back one time to, to help with his children that needed to get married. So he came back from Eretz Yisrael, he returned. 
During his visit coming back, he went to the Baal Shem Tov. He was there for Shabbos. And um, by the way, when he was in, in Eretz Yisrael, he went and he was in the yeshiva of the Mekubalim by the Rashash. The Rashash is known as Shalom Sharabi, one of the big, big Mekubalim. He had a yeshiva for Mekubalim, Yerushalayim. And Reb, and Reb Gershon was, is listed as one of the students in that yeshiva. In any case, back to the story, he comes back to the Baal Shem Tov. I said the story today when we were learning Hasidus in the morning. And during the davening, I'm sorry, so it came Friday night, and the Baal Shem Tov was davening Mincha. And Baal Shem Tov used to, it's a known thing, that the Baal Shem Tov used to daven very long Mincha Friday before Shabbos. It was a very long Mincha. So Reb Gershon used to daven also with the Kavanas of the Arizal. He was a huge Mekubal. And he had the Siddur there, and he was doing his Kavanas. It also doesn't take short. But he finished. And he had time. The Baal Shem Tov was still standing. So he went and he took a Shnaya Mikra, a, a Chumash, and you do two times Chumash, and, two, and he went, he was, he was Mava said with the whole parasha, which takes a long time. I, like, I don't know what kind of parasha it was, whichever parasha it is, but it can be anywhere from, from 25 minutes to 45 minutes. And the Baal Shem Tov still didn't finish my Nesri. And he was tired, so he went to take a nap. <laughs> he napped, he said Shnaya Mikra, and uh, yeah, he did Shlesha Prakim, yeah. Okay, finally the Baal Shem Tov was, was done and they davened. So at night they were sitting by the meal and he says to the Baal Shem Tov, I also have Kavanes Ari, like you. I have, them, I have the mystical meditations. And, um, but, but I don't daven. It didn't take me so long. I can do it pretty quick. And you, he says, I, I, and he said, I finished davening. I did Shnai Mikra. I did my nap, and when I woke up, you're still going like this. He chapped a little with the Baal Shemtev, because the Baal Shemtev used to daven, the Baal Shemtev used to, used, to be, used to shake like a leaf a lot of times. And the reason why he did that was because he wanted to provoke the Baal Shemtev, the Chepazich, because he was hoping he would get out from the Baal Shemtev what's going on. So the Baal Shemtev said to him, first the Baal Shemtev didn't want to answer him, but then when he persisted, the Baal Shem Tov said that when I daven and I have the kavanis, when I get to the words machaye mesim, and when the person who relates the story says, he doesn't remember if when the person said the story, if it was machaye mesim ata or machaye mesim, it says twice, machaye mesim rav lo ishia, which, which, which machaye mesim. But well, one of the two, when the Baal Shem Tov said machaye mesim, the Baal Shem Tov says, thousands upon thousands of neshamas come, like flocks, and they come to me to seek a tikkun, that I should be misakin them. And I have to start being misakin the shamas. I have to fix souls. With each soul, I have to figure out why they banished him. And then I need to like work things out on his behalf. So it takes a while, he says. He says, if I were to stand there and take care of all the neshamas that are there, I would be standing for three years. He says, but when, when I hear the announcement, mekudish, mekudish, which means that it's Shabbos, Lamaila above, so I know that I have to stop. So I know I need to stop. And that's it. So the rest of the neshamas have to come back the following week. Or whatever. So the, the Reb, Reb, uh, Reb, Reb Gershon says to the Baal Shem Tov, I have the, also the kavanas. How come they don't come to me? <laughs> so the Baal Shem Tov said, stay next Shabbos. So he was there for the next week. The Baal Shem Tov told him what kavanas he should have. What should be his intentions. And when they started davening Shemayin Esrei, the, when they, they got to Mincha to Shemayin Esrei, the Baal Shem Tov waited, and he let his brother-in-law start. And the Baal Shem Tov, meanwhile, was, I forgot he said what he was doing. And he, and he, and he because he knew that his brother-in-law was going to need some help in a few minutes. So he stood by and watched. And when he, when he saw him getting to Machaya Mason Mata, suddenly he, see, he collapsed and he fell down and he fainted. So the Baal Shem Tev had him revived. They revived him and they sat him down and calmed down and whatever. And the Baal Shem Tev davened afterwards and did his thing. 
And then when they came to my afterward by the meal again, um, the Baal Shem Tov said, no, so how was it? <laughs> so he said that I had the souls all coming to me and I couldn't handle it. It was like he's like a flocks and flocks and flocks and he got terrified. So the Baal Shem Tov said to the Chevr over there, give him patch as all the chapin him into Baal Shem Tov. Give him, give him, give him patch, give him, he basically was saying, you know, whack him up a little that he shouldn't start up with me anymore. Um, and here's another very cool story. This story is actually brought in Hasidus. The Alter Rebbe brings the story. He doesn't bring the full story. He brings a remes to the story and the Tzemach Tzedek and Derech Metzasecha also brings the story. This story was that Rav Gershon of Kitava was in Tzvas. When he was in, when he was in Yisrael, he lived in Hebron and he lived in Yerushalayim. But at some time, he was there for, I think, more than 10 years, he hopped over to Tzvas. And when he was there, he got to meet the, 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 the... It's very interesting. There's a lot of letters that Reb Gershon Kittiver and the Baal Shem Tov write to each other from, from Eretz Yisrael. They, they exchanged letters. I don't know. There's quite a few letters. And you see the love the Baal Shem Tov had for him. It's really, really powerful. But it's, it's, and you see how hard it was for him because most of the... He first lived in Hebron and were only Sephardim. And he was very Ashkenazi and he didn't, he didn't feel like he fit. He couldn't connect. And he writes, I don't know how and what, and 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 and, and, and it's a lot. It's very interesting reading to read the their their the 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 correspondence. But here there was a Sephardic rabbi. He was he was known as a chacham, and they were friendly. Him and the and him and the Rav Gershon were, were you know you know found you know they 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 they, they connected, and um, one time. Rav Gershon says to, says to this fellow that, um, says it is Chacham, that I, I, I have, I'm, I'm, I'm in a tight situation. I don't have any money for Shabbos. And I'm going to have to simply go take a loan for food for Shabbos. All right. So then they were both in shul and it was, it was, it was cold. So Reb Gershon went and he wrapped himself in a, in, a, in a blanket or something or some kind of a thing and it had a pocket. And he was holding it. And while he was wrapping it, there was a pocket there and a little, a little uh, kiss, a little wallet fell out. And he didn't notice that it fell out. The Chacham saw that it fell out. He went and he picked it up. And in the wallet, he can hear that there are coins there. And they felt, he can feel it, they felt like they were pretty big coins. And in his mind, he thought it was gold coins. So he got very upset that Reb Gershon told him that he has no money. Here he has, what is he telling him stories? He's got money in his pocket. I just picked up his money, his cash that he's got here. So he, he comes after Reb Gershon. Uh, he says to Reb Gershon, you mentioned that you don't have any money. Is that true? He says, no, I don't have, I don't have anything for Shabbos. So... He's, and, and he says, and, and, and like, and, and, and he says, and by the chacham, and, and, and over there, like the, a lie was the worst thing. Like you don't lie. So he says, you sure you don't have any money? He says, no, I don't have any money. He, he, so he confronts him right up. He says, you're a liar. So he says, I'm not a liar. I don't have any money. He says, but you do have money. He says, I don't have. Back and forth. So that he got he got upset, and he, this chacham, and he goes over to the Aron Kodesh, and he says, "I swear, that you're that you're a liar." So Reb Gershon got really upset, being accused as a liar. He turns to him and he says, "I'm putting you in cherem." So the chacham immediately went and he took off his shoes, because when you put into cherem, you can't you know your menuda, you go in a nidoy, took off his shoes. And he was furious, and he went back to his home, went back, and he started telling the people that that this this person who came from Yerushalayim, they say he's a fine this, but he's, to me he doesn't look like he's a tzaddik at all. He's a liar, and not only did he not only did he lie to me, but he even went and put me in cherem, and he's disrespectful to the rabbi of the town. So uh, the people were upset. So this whole group of from the Sephardi cloys over there from the shul, all come to confront Rav Gershon. 
And they said to him, you know, Matach. They start yelling at him. What's going on? So he says, what do you mind? He accused me as a liar. So, he, so they said, yeah, but you did. Here's the, here is this thing. There is the money. That, until now he, now he produced the evidence. He said, this is the money. So he opens it up and he, he says, the money that's here, he says, is, 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 was coins from Poland and they're worthless over there. I can't, I can't do anything with it. It, didn't, it hasn't uh, exchanged it and he couldn't exchange it either. So I have nish for satan. If there's nothing I can do with it, he says. And if that's the case, he says, when I, I have a I have a besamin box of silver too. It's not like I don't have. It's just that I, I, I you know, I, nothing that no cash. I had nothing. I had nothing that has. So he says. So he says. But 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 he didn't know. He says. Well, before he accused me, he should have gotten this. He should. He says. Yeah, but he couldn't figure out how to open it. Because there was. So he said. But he should have. He said he should have ripped it open before he accused me as being a liar. So the re- so the chacham came and asked for forgiveness. A little a, a while later, Rav Geshen receives a letter from the Balshemtov, and the Balshemtov says that I've seen in the higher realms, in a certain heichal, that you were being judged lamaila for offending, for being, for going up against the rav of the city. And I tried to go into the Heichal to defend you, but they locked it. They de- locked me out. So I yelled and I cried out. I said, I said he didn't mean it. He didn't, he's, he's doing it, he's not doing it for his own sake. He did it for, 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 uh, for, for, for. He was Mekana for you. That's what he said. He's mekana. And I was, I, I was able to annul your decree. So the Geshen writes back to the Bolshev. The story is true. What you wrote to me is true. This happened. But what is a Pella by me, what is a real Pella, is when I see that when you sent the letter, the story hadn't happened yet. <laughs> In other words, it's a true story, but it happened after the date of the letter. So the Alter Rebbe brings this, this story and he says that, so, so when Rebbe Gershon asked the Baal Shem Tov about it, the Baal Shem Tov says, you don't know how things are in the, in the higher worlds, how you see things in the higher world. So in the Alter Rebbe ex- explains, or the, the Tzemach Tzedek explains, that in, in the higher worlds, time is very different. So there is like, there, in other words, what, what, there, there it's, 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 it's what, what manifests over here in many days or hours or, or time is, a, is there in one akuda in one point. And therefore, they get to see the folder up there of things that are going to happen much later, even before they happen. And it's not that they're seeing it because they know what's going to happen later, because up there it happened already. It's like a weird, weird thing. Even things where you have free choice. So that's like a really... Because, because the events that happened somehow in a higher realm, it's, it's, it's past, present, and future. So it's, it's, it's in a different realm of time and space. And when the Baal Shem Tov was seeing things, he was able to see something that was going to happen later. But it didn't. L'chaim. L'chaim.
Friday night when the Baal Shem Tov suddenly said what happened to my brother-in-law I don't see him in Eretz Yisrael I don't, I, the Baal Shem Tov one Friday night said I, I don't know what happened to my brother-in-law I don't see him in Eretz Yisrael the next day on Shabbos the Baal Shem Tov said hey there is my brother-in-law He's in Eretz Yisrael. So, there was a mud in the mice. He didn't, how can, oh, so the, and the Baal Shem Tov was wondering, he said, how can I not see him in Eretz Yisrael? And how, how's he Shabbos and day in, is in Eretz Yisrael? Later, when he asked Reb Gershon Kitaver about what happened, yeah. Reb Gershon was trying to remember, and Reb Gershon said, oh yeah, that Friday night, I was invited that Shabbos to go to the city of Akko. In the city of Akko, there are two shuls. One of them is inside the borders of Eretz Yisrael, and one is outside. Because <laughs> the, the Gemara says that Akko is part of his in, in, in Eretz Yisrael, and one is out. <gasps> Friday night, I went to Davin in the shul that was outside. And I was bothered while I was there. It's... It, it, I, like, why did I do that? You can be in Eretz Yisrael and I'm davening outside of Eretz Yisrael. And the next day I said, I'm not davening here, I'm going to the other shul. And the Baal Shem Tev sent to him that he sees him, <laughs> that he was wondering why Friday night he wasn't in Eretz Yisrael. How can he be on one Shabbos? Um, here's a very interesting story. Repinchas of Karetz related, related, the first story is, one time, Reb Pinchas of Karitz was relating three, three stories of the Anche Baal Shem Tov, the Baal Shem Tov's people, miracle stories of them. And one of the stories that he related, it's brought, the story is brought in the Sefer Medrash Pinchas, one of the stories that he related was that when Reb, Reb, Reb Nachman of Hore Dunker, one of the great students of the Baal Shem Tov, went to Eretz Yisrael, he, he met up with Reb Gershon Kitover. And they were there, they spent their Shabbos together. They were Shabbos together, they were having a very nice time. And they were fabrenging together at night. When sad, these two tzaddikim, when suddenly the lamp, they had a, they had a, they had a fire, a, 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 a licht, a, 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 that was, and the licht was getting close to being extinguished. And Reb Gershon looked at the lamp and he said, Vusidas, you're going to burn out? And it continued burning. Rav Gershon came home Matzah Shabbos. He turned to the Licht and he says, eh, genigeven. Enough. And when he said enough, that's when it was extinguished. It was supposed to burn out Friday night. He said, Mamish, he, he, he told, he looked, at, he spoke to the lamp and he said, what's it, it's going to burn out now. And mitten, and mitten, did it. and mitten, the fabrengen, what's going on? <laughs> a mitten, a middle of a Hasidish of Abrengen. That was that. And the other story is an interesting story. While Reb Gershon was leaving to Eretz Yisrael, the Baal Shem Tov had him come to Mezhabuz, and he kept him there for three years. The son of Reb Gershon related the story. His name was Reb Leib. Three years he stayed with his family 
And the Baal Shem Tov covered his expenses for three years. And he was learning. During that time, one time he was making a, a Siyam Mashas. Reb Gershon was going to make a Siyam Mashas. In the honor of the Siyam Mashas, the next day they were going to make a nice party. So he asked the Baal Shem Tov that the Baal Shem Tov should be machabed him and come to the Siyam Mashas. And the Baal Shem Tov promised him that he would come. He was up all night, finishing up because he had some blots to finish, so he should be able, ready for the morning for the Siyam Mashas. He davened early morning and he was feeling a little tired because he was up all night. So he decided to go up a little drimo, to get a little nap. And as he, as he, as he naps and he falls, he falls asleep, and as he's sleeping, he's dreaming. In his dream, he left Mezhebush, and he's out in the, in, in the road somewhere, and he's walking and walking, and suddenly he doesn't know where he is. And, he's, and, and, he's, and he realizes, oh yeah, i got to get back for the Siyam. The Baal Shem Tev is coming, I'm not going to be there on time. And the more he's running, the more he's getting lost. He can't find his way. Back and forth, back and forth. He doesn't know what to do. He's getting more antsy and more antsy. And in his dream, in his dream, he's wandering three days already. And he can't find his way back. And he doesn't find his soul. And he doesn't know. And he's getting so nervous because it's like, and what's bothering the whole time is that he needs to get to the sea and with the Baal Tov is coming and he's not going to be there. Suddenly he meets another Yid, a Jew from a, 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 another person on the road. And he says hello to him. And the guy says to him, I'm on the road for three days. Do you know how to go to, uh, how do you go to Broad? That's what he says. How do you go to Broad? So Reb Gershon says to him, who, who, and the guy, and, he, and he, so Reb Gershon says, who are you? He said to him, this and this person, I, I am the helper of of this rich fellow, and I am the I'm the bus driver for his children. I take his children to the Malamed every day. I do his, and I don't know. I walked out for a walk or something, and I got myself lost. And for three days, I'm already wandering, and I can't make my way back. And he's and I'm having a lot of anxiety because I know my boss is going to be so mad at me. Who I left? I didn't. I'm not, I'm, I'm not taking care of the children. I just disappeared like that, and and of Gershon. And Reb Gershon says, ah, I know that person you're mentioning. I know you, but you I don't know. Okay. So the two of them are making their way. They're looking. They're not, now they're together at least. And as they're walking, they're sharing their frustrations, each one, how they're... When suddenly they come across it, this big mansion. And they go, again, this is all in the dream. He goes into the mansion. And no, as he gets close, he hears the sound of Torah being studied from this mansion. And so Rabbi Gershon is, is a, listens in, and he, he's enjoying very much the Chidushi Torah that are coming out. So he goes in, and he sees there's a Rosh Hashiva there. And this Rosh Hashiva is teaching all the students. So he sits down, and he's Machaya. After the Shir is over, he goes over to the Rosh Hashiva, and he says to the Rosh Hashiva, do you know how to get to Mezhebush or to Brod? Do you know the road? Because we're lost over here. He needs to go to Brod. I need to go to Mezhebush. I need to go back. He looks at him and he says, this is, there is no Brod. And I don't know what you're talking about. There's no Mezhebush. This is, this is, I've never, never heard of that place. It doesn't exist over here. He says, I, 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 what do you mean there's no one over here? I come from there. And I need to go back. And, 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 and I'm having the Baal is coming to my thing and I need to get back there and I can't get back. And, and he's insisting. He says, there isn't no, there is no, um, there is no, it doesn't exist. Back and forth and back and forth. So Reb Gershon says, so that, and then the Rosh Hashiva says to him, why do you have to Pachkazich go there? Why don't you stay with us over here? Stay with us. So he says, no, I have to go. He says, no, no, stay here. No, I have to go. He says, listen, I can't help you. You need to find your guy. I can't help you. But go into the next, into the next area, the next yeshiva. Try over there. So he moves over, and he sees even a more exquisite area. And again, he hears a shear, and he goes in, and this shear is even 
mufli like crazy and he's enjoying it. The shir is over. He goes over to the Rosh Hashiv and he says to him, do you, where's Mezhebush? What's with this place? No one knows what's, where, where. So he says, this is the only world here. There is no measure. I don't know what you're talking. Which place? He says, Vesnisht. Back and forth, Vesnisht. Doesn't know. I don't know what you're talking about. And he says, by the way, why do you have to schlepsuch? Stay over here. And they started nudging both him and the other one to stay over there. The other guy said, I have to go back to Broad. I have to get back. And they said, no, stay here. And now the second place, the other guy relented. And he said, I'm, 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 I'm going to stay. Okay, you know what? It's very nice over here. So, but Rav Gershon says, I must go. To, the Baal is waiting for me. I must go. So he says, if you know, maybe try the third place. So he goes into the next place. There's another chamber. And again, even more exquisite than one before. And again, a Rosh Hashiva teaching. And afterwards, he speaks to him. And he says to him, and he says, Bring me the map. He says, bring me the map. They bring a map. And he looks. And it's a map of all the worlds. And he says, yeah, 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 yeah. There is that little, 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 little over there. The Nebuchadnezzar world over there. Somewhere. And, and over there, there's a town there of Mezhebush and Broad. And he shows him that somewhere over there. Ah. He said, maybe you stay over here. He says, no, 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 I have to go. The Baal is waiting. He says, no, stay. He says, no. Meanwhile, this other Yid had came and, 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 and walked him to the third world, and now he, he, he said, but he's going back. He's staying there. So he went back, and they said, okay, if you want, to, you want your way back to Mezhebush, take him. So that he says they, they took him to the door, and they pushed him out, and he, like, he felt like he's falling, and he woke up. And he woke up and he sees the Baal Shem Tov is there at the, and he tells, and he, and he just woke up and he starts saying what happened to him. Like, where was he, what? And the Baal Shem Tov sent a shliach to go check in broad on this other yid. And they asked him, where is this person? And he said, yeah, he was sleeping and he passed, and he passed away in his sleep. This other yid had passed away. They asked him to stay and he had passed away in his sleep. And the Baal Shem Tov said something, the world, oh, the world needed him. And somehow, again, the story, this is what this was brought in the Sefer Medrash, Pinchas from the Pinchas of Karetz. The Baal Shem Tov said that this was Nishmas Yesef Atzadik, this other Yid who was with him. And the world could have used him, but, well, they needed him. They needed it up there. I don't know. It was strange, a strange thing. You know, yeah. Ah. Uh, Chaim. Yeah. What's it going to say with the Pinchas of Kodesh? Hmm. What's it going to say with the Pinchas of Kodesh? Because it's Kodesh. I think you just. There's. It's in the Sefer. I wonder was there a Pinchas of Kodesh? I don't think Rabbi Chaim said the story. It was said by. Chaim. Ha ha.
So the famous letter where the Balshem Tov says that he went up to the Heichel of Mashiach, and Mashiach said, then he asked the Balshem Tov, Amos, I call Asimar. Balshem Tov asked Mashiach, when are you coming? And he said, when yours wellsprings are going to spread across the world. That's from the letter that the Balshem Tov sent to Reb Gershon of Kittiver. So the famous Amos, I call Asimar, that whole, that whole idea of Hasidus is where we have it, that the, that the whole Avoida is to spread the Balshem Tov's teachings. It's from the Balshem Tov's letter to his brother-in-law. There's a letter over here where he he writes to him. Like I can't write long. I would I would like to write long with Latayel Barichas. But because of my tears, when I think about you leaving me, I can't even speak. Very interesting. You see how deeply connected they are. Uh, it hurt him very much. But he, he, but he sent his brother-in-law. He wanted him to be in Eretz Yisrael. Um, according to some, his trip to Eretz Yisrael was to meet the Arachayim HaKadosh. But he never... There is a story about him meeting the Arachayim, but it's a very, very unsubstantiated story because according to most accounts and according to a letter that is in the Geniza, um, he writes to the Baal Shem Tov that this big makubal that you told me to find out about Again, it wasn't like, go look up to Arachayim. Arachayim wasn't known as Arachayim. That was, he was living then. So it wasn't like no one knew about him. So he said, I, I did inquiries about him, and I found out that there was a huge tzaddik here. His name was Arachayim ben Atari. He only was Eichet to be in Yerushalayim for one year. And, but I missed him because he passed away. So the Pashtas, they never, they never met. He never met with the Arachayim. The... But it's interesting that it said, as we said earlier, that it seems like he did get to, he, he was studying in the yeshiva of the Rashash. The stories that are told that when he was in Eretz Yisrael, he went to Hebron first. Um, and he was being begged by the, Chachm, the Chachamim of Yerushalayim that he should come to them. He finally came to visit Yerushalayim, and he writes how for eight days, they pestered him and pestered him and they sent him the, the, the Ashkenazim, the Sephardim. Everybody was begging him to accept to be the rabbi. In your, imagine, Yerushalayim, they were begging him to be their rabbi. And he writes to the Baal Shem Tov, how I, how, how I refused and I refused and I refused. And then he says, after eight days, I couldn't withstand their tears and I gave in. But then he managed to like even after he, he, he agreed upon it, he, 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 um, he escaped. He, he didn't want to stay. In, he, he didn't want to be a rabbinic figure in, in Yerushalayim. Um, there is a story that the, that the Rashash, there is a story that the Rashash was asking him the story was that the Rashash was asking him to, um, there, was, there was no rain in Yerushalayim one time, and the Rashash sent Reb Gershon Kittiver that he should be the chazan, they should have a fast day, he was geyser a fast, and he asked that Reb Gershon should be the one who would be the chazan. Now the minig in those days were that the one who was the chazan would give divrei kavushin, would speak words of Musr, and the way the Musar one, the style was that they would actually just quote Mamare Chazal and just state verbatim. So Rab Gershon was up that night preparing. When he came the next morning, he was he found himself hoarse. So he told the Rashash that I don't have a voice. He, he had so the whole thing was cancelled. They, they were still gonna Davin, but he wasn't gonna be for the Yaman. And so he sent someone else to the Yaman, to Davin, to be the Chazan. And then when it gets to Az Yashir, the Rishash hears that his voice came back to him. So he went over to the Chazan after Shemayin Esrei, and he told him to go, and he put he sent back Reb Gershon to go Davin. Reb Gershon did Chazar Sashats, and when he started saying Slichas, he said the first piece, and then he, and then he stepped away. He said he doesn't. He can't. He can't say the rest. It was strange. He was, he's insisting he's not davening the rest. His son asked, later asked his father, "What is it? What? Why did you decline?" He said, "Because when I started saying slichas, 
The Gemara says that if someone's tefillah is shagar bepiv, if someone's tefillah is fluent in his mouth, it means that his prayers are going to be answered. So I knew that if I continued tzlichus, it would start raining right then and there. And I wasn't comfortable with that, with that show. So I stepped away. He says, but I, and the reason I stepped, but these people need rain, and I'm able to bring rain, show or not, I, need, I knew it's going to come within, within the next two, three days. But he didn't want to do it in a way that it should happen while he's the one. Because he said, I saw that it was tefillah se shagar bepi, and I knew that it's, like the Gemara says, of Rav Chanina ben Daisa, he would say, who's going to live in his eye? He said, I knew that if, I, if I'll if daven, it's going to activate the rain right then and there. Um, just another two short little stories that are cute with the Baal Shem Tov. So this seems to happen when, when the Baal Shem Tov was still not known. Um, one time, he, the Baal Shem Tov had a horse, and the horse was stolen. And uh, Rav Gershon came and said, you're such a shlamazal, he yelled at his brother-in-law. You find that you, even the one horse that we, you know, that you have, you know. So the Baal Shem Tov was annoyed, I guess, that he was bother, bothering him. And the Baal Shem Tov said to him, again, he was pretending to be, but the, in the course of, the, of his annoyance to him, the Baal Shem Tov said, you'll see, the horse will come back to me. So this was like the biggest joke to him. Only the horse will come back to you. So he was making fun of him the whole year. Every time you would see him, he would say, no, the horse came back already. The horse is sitting here, coming the horse. A year later, a, 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 a guy comes, comes past their house and he knocks on the window and, and, they look, and the guy's asking them to be able to light his pipe. He wants fire. That's this, this, this non-Jew. He says, give me some pot, from, some fire. And the Baal looked and the Baal said, hey, that's my horse. <laughs> So the guy had admitted it right then and there, and he got off the horse and he gave back the horse. A, a, a little, a little, a little moment where the Baal Shem Tov said, my, "You'll see, my horse will come back to me." And the second thing was, I'm not sure when the story happened. It's a cool story. The 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 Toldis Yaakov Yosef brings this story in his sefer. He says it says in the Zoyar that the Zoyar says explicitly that big. Tzadikim, the big Tanoyim and Amaroyim, when they would hear someone say a Mishnah, from the words the person was saying in Torah, they can they can see what's going to happen in a day in the, the, uh, in a day or or the, in a day or two. In other words, when they heard someone learning, they can hear in his learning what was going to happen in a day or two. And then the Torah says, and the Baal Shem Tov was able to see when he heard someone's learning, he was able to see what was going to happen. He, a year ahead of time. And the, the Torah is trying to say it as, a, as, as the greatness of the Baal Shem Tov, that even greater than what it says in the Zohar. The Zohar says when it, and he brings a story. And either he heard the story from the Baal Shem Tov himself, I, I couldn't get, the, when I was trying to read, I was trying to fix if he heard it from the Baal Shem Tov or who's talking in the story. But it, it says like this, that one time he came to Maybe the Baal Shem Tov is relating the story. He says, I came to my brother-in-law, Rav Gershon's house, and Rav Gershon wasn't home. And at that time, and then suddenly, Rav Gershon came, came to the house, and he said, or, or someone, who came? Someone brought news that, oh, you heard what happened? This and this fellow in the town was arrested, a tax collector, and they took him away in, in handcuffs. They took him away in chains. So Reb Gershon turned and Reb Gershon said, oh, no, Cyrillic told me this already a year ago, that this was going to happen. What was the story? The story was that Reb that Rabbi Gershon was, was learning Mishnayas, and the Baal Shem Tov heard him say a Mishnah, two Mishnahs, and the Baal Shem Tov went over to him, the Baal Shem Tov said to him, do you understand what you learned? So he thought he's asking him if he understands the Mishnah, the simple meaning. He said, yeah. So the Baal Shem Tov said, no, two Chedushim happened over here. Two, two, two Chedushim. You have two enemies in this town who are making you trouble. And from the Chedushim in the Mishnah is as follows. One of them 
one of them is going gonna, is gonna, is gonna to make up with you, is going to reconcile with you, and the other one is going to be punished. That's what he says, one of them. And he says, Kacheva, this is what happened. It was on this, maybe on Simchas Torah, when it was, when I was walking, I passed by the house of one of the guys that was making trouble, and he called me in, and he, and he said to me, he wants to ask me for forgiveness. The other guy, this tax collector, who was the other guy who was making him tsaris, ended up being taken away by chains. They took him away, they arrested him, whatever. So where did the Baal Shem Tov hear it? The Baal Shem Tov heard it in the Mishnah that he was learning. So the way, why I get it is when a person learns Torah, they really, the Mishnah, the Torah that they're learning is foretelling their own events that are going to happen in their own life. But if you're, if you're the Baal Shem Tov, or like the, this, you're able to hear. Like he thought, and you don't realize what you're learning. You're, the Torah is a godly learning. So it's actually, you're, you're foretelling your own life. But you have, to be able to, you have to be able to listen and hear that in the Chidushim or in the... Yeah, you, you, Torah can be heard on various different levels. So I guess from the story, I couldn't figure out if he already at that time knew that the Baal was a tzaddik, or he didn't. He just said, Srilik uh, told me about this. Like he was, he, It looks like the Baal was doing weird stuff, but he thought he's probably crazy. So he probably, when he told him, he thought he's probably, oh, him again. You know, that kind of a thing. Um... And one last little story, we're going to conclude with this story, it was a cute story also. Um, uh, uh, this Reb Gedali, I don't know who he was, he came and he related that they said about Reb Gershon that when he was on, that he toiveled, that he toiveled in the, in the, in the, uh, in, he toiveled in the water what, next to the boat, next to the ship while the ship was going. And it's a very, he toiveled himself. He did a tefillah. So the person who heard the story said, that's Mamash Sakonis Nefashis. To jump out, to jump overboard on a boat, on a ship in the middle of the ocean, and to toivel is a dangerous situation. It's dangerous from the ship. You can get hurt with the, I guess, the propellers and the. So, um, the guy said, "I heard the story from Reb Tzvi of Kamik, Kaminker, and when I asked him the same question, he said we were sitting on the same porch, on the same place." together with Rav Gershon, and I asked Rav Gershon the story, they say about you that you toiveled, that you toiveled in the, in, the, in the water at the time when the ship was, so he says, nah, that's not the story. The story was, I was, I got out of where he was on a trip, I don't know where, maybe it was on a trip to Eretz Yisrael, I'm not exactly sure. And I saw that there were certain dinam on the, on the ship, Dina means judgment on the ship, and I wanted to be mamtik the dinam, and I knew to be mamtik the dinam to sweeten the judgments, a mikvah would be very helpful. But I wasn't going to go jump over in the water. It, meanwhile, the boat came and docked by a little island. And, the, and all the sailors went off the boat and they went and they were doing whatever. And I figured this would be a great opportunity. No, 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 no. I forgot. First he teased them. And he said, what are you talking about? He says, of course. He says, you ever see the sailors on the boat? They throw out such a, like a tube. And, then, and, it, has, and it has stairs and ladders. And they all go swimming in it. And uh, so what, what's the Chiddush that I toiveled in it? But then he said, no, 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 it's not. I didn't swim in the, two, in the pool. The story that happened was, we got to an island, and they, and they did, and I figured this is a good chance to go to be toivel. So I went down in the, in the cabin, the underneath cabin, I got undressed, and I jumped in the water and I toiveled. Meanwhile, by the time I got out of the water, they had gotten, it looks like he was tiveling with Kavanas. I'm not exactly sure what he was doing. By the time I got up, the boat was, was gone. The ship was gone. And I was sitting over there. I didn't have my clothing. And I'm thinking to myself, what am I doing now? I'm stuck over here on the island. He's mamish. And, and I have no, and I, with, with, on the island, no clothing and no food. I can't stay here. So I figured, you know what, I'm not a bad swimmer. He knew that. He said because he once jumped into the Niester to save, to save a person that was drowning. And he managed to swim quite a distance to get him. So he, so he knew that he has a koyach. He's bal koyach, he can swim. So he, he said, I, I, I started to swim be after, the, after the boat. And I caught up with the ship. And as I got close, but as I got close to the ship, I, there was tar, it was because it was a tar, 
a thing, it was slippery, and I couldn't climb on. And I was yelling and yelling, but the noise of the ship was making so much noise from the oars, or I don't know what kind of ship it was. There was so much noise that was being made that they didn't hear me. And I was screaming, help me. And the ship continued. So I continued swimming after it again. I caught up with the ship a second time, and I was feeling that my kachis were literally. And I reached a point where I thought, finito. And I was so, I was so knocked out that I couldn't even say vidoy. I knew that my time has come, I'm gonna drown over here. And I thought to myself, what a bummer. He says, I'm, I'm dying over here in the, in, the, in the ocean, and I'm gonna be in trouble for that because this was suicidal. Because he went and I did a mikvah and it was all my own fault, they're gonna blame me as a ma'abadatz ma'iladas, that I killed myself, and then I'm not gonna, which is not a good thing. And I was very frustrated. And at that time, suddenly, an Arab jumped off the, a Yishma'eli, he says, jumped off the ship and, and came on a little, uh, on a small little side, little uh, infl inflatable raft. And he came, moved all the way over to me, grabbed me, pulled me in, brought me to the ship, threw me over, and good. And I fell down and I was so exhausted. He says, and I was, and I was, I was throwing up, and because I had all the th all the water that I had swallowed, and I was for a while, and it took me like two hours. And finally, after two hours, I was able to come to my strength. I went up on the ship, and I was looking for the Arab because I wanted to thank him for saving my life. And I looked, I looked, I looked. There was no Arab. There was nothing. And then I realized that this is Ahitaya. This is this, this is. With the, the, with the, the, this is the Arab that Eli, it's the Gemara it says stories many times that an Arab appeared which was a Leo Anavi dressed in an Arab that's one of a Leo Anavi's costumes <laughs> so I knew it was it was uh, a Leo on the raft he said this is Given Ahu Taya this was that that Arab who came to get him so these are the stories I managed to find on Reb Gershon of Kitav uh, what, what I did not do and what is worthwhile really doing is to read through the letters of correspondence between him and the Baal Shem Tov. Uh, they're very, we, most of these letters were found in a cachet of old. They found a, um, a, hidden, a hidden treasure trove of letters. It was a whole argument in Europe if these were authentic letters or they're not authentic letters. Our Chabad Rebbeim believed that these letters were authentic. And in those letters, there's some correspondence. And, if I, and I didn't get a chance to, to read them now. I remember reading them a long time ago. There's a lot of Reb Gershon having, exp saying what a hard time he's having in, in, uh, in Eretz Yisrael. And he writes with such detail to the Baal Shem Tov, all the tsaris that he has and all the difficulties and the hardship and how his wife is having an enormous, his wife's name was Bluma, and she was having an, an enormous hard time. Uh, one, uh, w one more short story. That one time in, in Israel, the minog was that they would, they would sift, the, they would filter the water before they used it because the waters were taken out from pits and they were from, from like, they weren't, it, was, it wasn't very fresh water. And there was sometimes worms or other things in the water so they would all, even if they cooked it or if they drank it, they would, they would filter it. The Rebetzin of Rebbe Gershon didn't know that, and she didn't do it. The women in the community in Hebron, whether it was in Hebron, Yerushalayim, maybe it was in Yerushalayim, uh, they, 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 they looked at her like she's crazy. Who doesn't do that? Everybody does that. But, but in the old shtetl there, no one was doing it. But in Yerushalayim, this was the meaning. If it was only the Sephardic women, I'm not exactly sure. So they, they had this weird Ashkenazi lady, so they decided to tease her. And, they and one of them made a song, and in the song was making fun of her. She came home to her husband, and she was crying. And she said, why did you bring me here to this? You can believe that Israel is considered then a strange country where, th where I, don't even, I, I don't even know the behaviors. I don't know this and that. And they make fun of me. She was really hurt. She was really hurt by this. So she cried. So the Gershon got very upset. And he said, who was the one who wrote that song? So they went out, and then as she was walking, she showed her. So Rav Gersha said, Zu, she, and she can talk. She lost her, her, her ability to speak. That's the story. That's interesting.
So these were, uh, yeah, these were big tzaddikim. Did you write that in the letter, or this is a story? That um, this story, I'm not. Sh- I, I don't think this is in the letter. This is a story that's told from that time period. Yep. B'chaim. Tzchus ha'yagon aleinu v'akol Yisrael. Amen. The Teldus was the one who wrote down the... I don't know. He, was, he, he, he must have been one of the Chavraya Kaddisha, you know. I don't know. He was in the court. The Baal Shem Tov had tzaddikim, and he had simple people. There were 60 that were tzaddikim. He must have been one of the... Yeah, yeah, he was doing these in Yenon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he picked up on some of them. <laughs> you see, like like he was sitting there in the sukkah without the rain, you know. Yeah. Why not? Of course I can take.